Alrighty, thank you so much everyone for coming. This is the Health in COVID Times lecture for the seminar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Anya and this is my dad, Dr. Kinsley. I'm a nurse and we'll be presenting um, this lecture today and it really came out of a need we saw. You hear a lot about masks and social distancing and vaccination on, on the media, but you don't really hear anything about lifestyle and what you can do to protect yourself and optimize your immunity against a viral infection. So that's kind of where this class came out of. It was originally a four-part class to present to the community, so we had to condense it down um, into two, we're just gonna do about two of the topics and we just condense it down to fit the time that we have today. So there's a lot to cover, but we do have the full four part class on YouTube. If you're interested in listening to the whole thing, we can give you the name of that. If you go to North Pacific Aesthetics on YouTube, you will find our four part class there. Um, also it was designed for the public. Um, so trying in mind to keep it simple and easy to digest as well. And yes, perfect. Oh, and then the references. We do have references for all the content presented in this lecture. If you are interested in having those for yourself, we do have a PDF form that we can email to you or share with you somehow that has all the links to the references for the information contained in this lecture. And yes, Dr. Kinsey will be sharing about um, the immune system first. And then I will talk about different ways we can assist and optimize our immune system in the second half of our lecture. But before we start, let's just look at a quote here from Ministry of Healing. It says, too little attention is generally given to the preservation of health. It is far better to prevent disease than to know how to treat it when contracted. It is the duty of every person for his own sake and for the sake of humanity to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and conscientiously to obey them. All need to become acquainted with what is most wonderful of all organisms, the human body. They should understand the functions of the various organs and the dependence of one upon another for the healthy action of all. They should study the influence of the mind upon the body and the body upon the mind and the laws which they are governed. Counsel for us to really understand and the importance of understanding how our body works. But before we do that, let's just have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Um, dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather together to learn about um, the human body, specifically the immune system, the wonderful creation you have made, and the different ways that we can work with your creation instead of against it, Lord. Uh, may your spirit be present to guide and teach us. Um, may this um, lecture be a blessing to those here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, let me add my good afternoon to that as well. Glad that you're here. Um, it is always a privilege to talk about the body and how it works. And every time I am um, more and more amazed as I, or continue to be amazed as I um, review some of these things. Um, as we talk about the immune system, um, why is it important to know about the immune system? What does our immune system do? Well. It is, we live in a world that is a microbial world. There's lots of bugs around. And uh, that means that we're constantly encountering microorganisms that could be bacteria or virus or, or fungus. Um, and so the body's human immune system continuously defends us against these threats to our survival. So understanding how immunity works is important to making sense of the things that we hear around us. We hear a lot of news, especially in the face of a pandemic, we hear a lot of news. We get a lot of information about disease and um, just putting it in the whole context of what is our body actually doing when we get an infection? What is our body actually doing to fight that infection? And what does our body actually doing when we get a vaccine or don't get a vaccine? What, what actually happens? Um, in, generally, in general, our body has natural defenses made up a network of, of cells and structures and organ and tissues that work together to protect the body. And the immune system is crucial for fighting infection. But not only infection, it's crucial for defending us against our 
our own body that goes awry, that goes wrong. So cancer is an example of that, and that's what we're most familiar with. So when something goes wrong and a cell malfunctions, our immune system actually can zero in and help defend our body against those things as well. Um, I'm just going to introduce you briefly. This is, you've heard of New Start. Well, we couldn't use New Start because that's a, everyone's uses New Start. So we made up a different an, uh, an acronym called Restored Life, which has all of those components and a few other dimensions that the New Start um, that you're more familiar with has. And Anya will touch on this. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm going to remind you as we go through the different parts of the immune system where these type of lifestyle issues and ways to protect our ways to optimize our immune system. Um, I want to first talk about how our immune system is activated. How do we know, how does our immune system know when to jump in and do something? Then we're going to talk about its function, what happens when it is activated, and then some of the structures of the immune system. Um, so activation. Our immune system is basically turned on or activated when we are exposed to some type of antigen some type of insult, something that invades us. So it's activated by the word antigens. So that's it. Um, so an antigen is basically a protein or a substance or a chemical that our body recognizes as foreign, something that we don't normally see. So bacteria have proteins on their surface, viruses have proteins on their surface, and they're not proteins that we normally have in our body, and because it's not a normal normal thing that's there, our immune system recognizes that. Now just think about it. That means your body has to recognize what's normal. And can you think of all of the proteins, the number of proteins that your body has on the different cell services, and the immune system has to, has to re recognize, okay, that's part of what's supposed to be here, and let's not do anything. It is, it is actually mind-boggling to, to know, to realize the specificity that's actually built into this. But antigens is the thing that activates our immune system. And then there are basically four functions. Now we can think of function of our immune system as both healthy and unhealthy. There's, both, there's, there's two kinds, but just general four functions, healthy functions of the immune system is first of all, our immune system composes of creating a barrier to protect our body from anything even getting in to begin with. And then second, if something gets past the barrier to identify the invader. And then once it identifies the invader, then to eliminate that invader, to stop it in its tracks and to get rid of it. And then also to generate some type of memory so that if your body sees that invader again, it is ready to respond in a much faster, more efficient manner if it sees it again. And this is why, this is why once you have an infection, that, your, that immune system is there to protect you. So if you get it again, you're very unlikely. A lot of times if you see a virus or get a cold, you see that and your immune system is gonna protect you. So if you see it again, your body just snuffs it out no problem because of that memory that's built up and now instead of having a more of a general um, broad response to an infection now it has a very specific targeted response and it squashes it out so that memory is super important healthy immune function protects the body by preventing or limit limiting sickness from infection caused by these harmful pathogens it successfully recognizes, it fights off, it removes these disease-causing pathogens or foreign substances, and it's able to distinguish again between what's healthy and what's not healthy, what belongs there and what doesn't belong there. And so if something goes awry, it can then respond to that problem. Now, there can be unhealthy immune function too. So one is if your immune, immune system doesn't respond like it should, it's sluggish and it's slow or not as robust and strong of a response as it should, you could see an infection and that infection could overwhelm the immune system and that's where we start to see you know, a lot more systemic disease and, and sickness and illness. Um, 
Or you could have, instead of an under-functioning immune system, you could have an over-functioning immune system. So an example of this would be like if you were exposed to some type of maybe grass allergen and your body saw it and people are exposed to grass and some people get exposed to the grass after mowing the grass and they start wheezing, their asthma flares up or their, run, their nose starts running. So this is an example of allergies or asthma that's overactive when it's exposed to this allergen and it stimulates the body and now you have a problem with breathing with asthma, for example. And this happens on the skin as well. Um, with uh, an example of that related to the allergies is a condition we call atopic dermatitis. Um, that's like in kids. You might see kids with real bad rashes and eczema that they get. And that's really a function of like asthma or allergies, this overactive immune response manifesting itself in the skin. And you can also see it another. What's another example of an overactive immune response that you can see sometimes sometimes on the skin. So psoriasis. So psoriasis is an example on the skin of an over-responsive, kind of an abnormal response of immune system that, that takes off in the, in the skin. Um, and then also if you see, if our body decides to see itself, normal parts of our body as harmful or if they, they don't recognize it as normal. So these are examples of diseases like say rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or things like this where you have these autoimmune diseases where normal tissues that belong in the body, your immune system is reacting against them and they're not supposed to. So these are some unhealthy immune functions. And a, an efficient immune response protects against any disease, many diseases and disorders, but an inefficient immune response allows those diseases to develop with too much or too little of the wrong immune response can cause an immune, um, either an infection or an immune system disorder. Um, so then let's think a little bit about the structures. What are the parts of our body that make up the immune system? Well, we talked about the barrier. So first of all, our skin is one of the, is the biggest organ in the body actually. And that is one of the uh, most important barriers that we have to, to our body. And if you think of every part of our body that's exposed to the air, the skin, well, we breathe in, so that means the mucous membranes in our mouth and in our lungs, those linings of those airway passages. Or we swallow things, and so that goes down our throat and into our stomach. Do you know your stomach and your intestines are actually outside the body? So it's inside out, so those things are inside out, and those, those are all barrier functions to the immune system. And then part of those, all of those barriers have beneficial bacteria. So those beneficial bacteria, you may have heard the term microbiome. That's a big term that's around lately. And uh, that includes normal bacteria that's inside the intestines, normal bacteria that's inside the airways, normal bacteria that's inside the mouth, normal bacteria that's on the skin. There's a microbiome that exists there. And then there's also um, some of our inflammatory cells secrete antimicrobial substances that are there as well. So these are all first line defenders on that barrier so that when things get there, they're very, it makes it hard for them to actually get in. Um, we think of reflexes like the cough and sneeze that, that clear mucus, that's an important part of our, our, our um, basic immune system. We don't really think of it like that, but it does as clearing, clearing um, mucus. But our lymphatic organs, the main ones that we think about are our bone marrow, our thymus, our spleen, and our tonsils. So the skin I've already talked about, the mucous membranes and the mucous membranes. Um, within these are immune cells. So within your skin and within your mucous membranes are immune cells that are sitting there waiting so that if an invader comes in, they can quickly identify it, either attack it or take it and alert the rest of the body and the rest of the immune system. So these inflammatory, these immune cells just sit there um, in these areas that are our barrier. And, and to keep the barrier healthy, um, we say, you know, when mucus builds up, what's a good way to keep mucus from building up? Drinking lots of 
water. So, I mean, this is pretty simple, right? Drink lots of water, helps keep your, the, the tissues well hydrated and that keeps that barrier in good function. I talked about the beneficial bacteria um, that are on the skin, the mucous membranes, the intestines, and these can aid in digestion, but they also kind of crowd out. If you have a, if you have a healthy crowd that are in danger to the body, they're gonna stop or prevent the, the, the abnormal or the invaders or the pathogens from being able to get in. They're gonna compete for food, they're gonna compete for room, and they're gonna just keep your body healthy. So you wanna keep these healthy bacteria around that normal microbiome. Um, the average human intestines contains about one kilogram of good bacteria. That would be about a bag of, I don't know, five pound bag or a one pound bag of sugar would be that, amount, you know, that much bacteria if you consolidate. It seems like a lot, right? They're, they're actually, it's a crowd, a friendly crowd that's there that's uh, keeping you healthy. So um, if we, there's been some studies that have looked at what happens if you deplete this microbiome. Uh, they've done this in mice to look at uh, both uh, the microbiome of the respiratory tract and they've seen that there's been increased bacterial and respiratory infections when they deplete that microbiome. And then there's been also some studies that looked, have looked at um, uh, seasonal respiratory infections in children who have um, been given uh, lots of lactobacilli and the bifidobacteria, which are part of our normal healthy bacterial flora. When they give them that, they actually have improved uh, less respiratory infections and things like that. So there's some evidence to show that if we pay attention to this, that it can have improved outcomes. Now, as far as um, things that we do in our life, obviously the food that we eat actually impacts what's going, going on in times as far as our intestines is concerned and that microbiome. Um, Antibacterial substances and antifungal substances, like I mentioned, these cells can secrete these and these act as, as kind of first line defenses on the barrier. Um, the next thing is looking at some of the primary lymphatic organs. So these are what we think of mostly. So the source of where our immune cells and our blood cells come from is the bone marrow. And um, here in the bone marrow are both the baseline cells and then that, that then differentiate, they, they divide into more specialized cells that can divide into more specialized cells. And we'll look at those a little bit later more specifically. But the bone marrow is super, super, super important. So there's a Bible text that you've heard of, right? Merry heart maketh good like a medicine and good good afternoon join us so merry heart maketh good like a medicine but a broken spirit dries up the bones right dries up the bones so do you think there's that would you think if the bible's telling us that would you would you say do you think there's any evidence that change in our mood and, and how we are in our hearts and what we're thinking if we're depressed or anxiety or down, that there has some significant impact on our immune system. Do you think there's any evidence to that effect? There actually is and so it doesn't surprise me um, especially as we read that in the Bible that it's actually true from the specific and then I was thinking of the example that uh, was given in one of the talks you know Ezekiel when D talked about Ezekiel 36 and 37 and the dry bones how about the real dry bones I mean real dry bones means no bone marrow known bone marrow means no ability to make blood cells no ability to make immune system there is no life without blood there is no, there'd be no life without immune system, we can turn our immune system down. I guess you'd have to live in a bubble to have a life without an immune system. So that's a primary source of a lot of these cells. The other, another major organ that, that we don't really think about too much is the thymus. And the thymus is really important because it is the training ground for maturation of T cells primarily, but other, other, other things as well. But the thymus is super important for maturation of some of these cells. And then, um, uh, 
And of course, how we eat and how those function is, is uh, important. And then this is what we typically think of with the lymphatic system, is we think of lymph nodes and all the, the small vessels. And this is basically the lymphatic system is carrying fluid that's outside the cells and it's bringing, circulating it. It's bringing it from the tissue to lymph nodes. This is kind of a pathway of cells. and. Um, inflammatory cells to find their way back to lymph nodes. Think of, think of it as this, the lymphatic system is the circulation of, of inflammatory cells to be able to make their way back and in the lymph nodes themselves are like the bases where these inflammatory cells can exchange information and communicate. Uh, and so that's what's actually happening. When you have an infection, how many of you ever had an infection and noticed that you had some bumps behind your ears or in your neck or some swollen lymph nodes? So basically what's happening is your, your lymphatic system is, is responding and there is something going on. There's some communication going on. There's some swelling going on there in response to something, whether it's a cut or an infection in the skin or somewhere else in, their, in the body. Um, the spleen is another organ that's we think of that's also important for filtration. Um, it uh, stores T cells and B cells and monocytes. It filters blood. Um, and takes out the, some of the old blood cells and platelets and turns them over. And uh, then, the, of course, they're replaced from the bone marrow. Um, and then cell-to-cell -cell communication takes place in the spleen. So the spleen is an important thing. Now, you could live without a spleen. People are in car accidents or, or have lost their spleen from injuries. So that can still happen, just like um, people can live without their tonsils. But these are still part of the immune system. The tonsils and the adenoids within the upper airway are thought to be, there's a lot that happens here. So just part to be a first line defense, uh, kind of like a reservoir of lymph nodes or um, res res reservoir of the immune system and the immune cells uh, to kind of protect us from respiratory infections and respiratory invaders through the airways. But some kids, you know, or some folks have lost their tonsils. How many of you have ever have lost your tonsils? It's interesting how the tonsils kind of shrink as we get older and you may not have problems with them anymore, but it's almost like they kind of regress. Um, so the last, uh, last thing I want us to think about with the immune system is there are two different branches of the immune system. Um, and the first one is the innate immune system. It's the one that's there all the time. It's always working 24-7, 365. It's not necessarily very specific. It's a kind of a general response to any problem. And so the first line of defense in the innate, innate system, again, as we've talked about, just kind of putting together the things we've talked about, is the, is the castle wall. So it's the barrier, it's the skin, it's the mucous membranes, it is the um, microbiome that we talked about that, in, that uh, covers our mucous membranes and our intestines and things like that. So that is the castle wall. But what if something gets in past the castle wall? Well, the next thing that happens in our innate immune system, the thing that's just working all the time, is there's some type of inflammatory response. There's a recognition of the invader, and so white cells, inflammatory cells, come in, and they, we, we use this word phagocytize. They basically, they basically engulf and digest. They engulf and digest that uh, invading body. And so that's the first and then second line defense of our innate immune system. So here's a question, is inflammation bad? I guess it depends. Yeah, exactly, that's the right answer. It depends, it depends. So, um, you know, if I, if, I ha if I step on a nail and uh, that nail, we pull out the nail and there's some inflammatory response. That inflammatory response is my, my body trying to get rid of the invaders that have now jumped into my system. And many times you've had cuts or injuries 
they don't turn into bad infections. They, are, they heal, it goes away, but you have some redness, some swelling, some tenderness. That's, that's good infl inflammation. That's exactly what you want your body to do. So it does, it totally depends. Um, um, rheumatoid arthritis is not good inflammation, is it? That's your, that's your immune system going awry against itself. But I want to think about now, so we talked about the, the first immune system. What did we call it? We called it the innate immune system. And now it's the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system I want you to think about is like the special ops. This is the person that got the, the, the invasion that got past the wall, got into the airport, got past TSA. It got past the first invaders and now uh, the, the first protection, and now these guys are loose inside the airport, inside our body. They're taking off, and so they're calling in special forces, the SWAT team, the special uh, ops unit. And this is specifically coordinated and generated against a specific infection. Um, and so what typically happens is you have your initial invasion, and you're trying to stop this thing, and some of your cells are taking uh, bacteria or virus and, and parts of it, and they're bringing it back to the lymph nodes to tell the lymph nodes back there. They're trying to tell the B cells and the lymph nodes, and they're trying to tell T cells in different places, hey, look, this guy is here. And they're giving you them the specific, you know, the specific, specific identification of the exact bacteria with the exact protein, and so then the body starts to generate T cells and B cells that are very specific. So they're training this special operations unit and they are training in the process. And so as this breaks through and they can't stop them at the front lines, these specific coordinated special ops cells come in and stop the invasion. And this is what's so amazing because if you think about it, every different antigen Every different bacteria that may have two or three or four antigens or virus that may have you know, one or two antigens that your body has been trained and has a specific set of B cells specifically so that if it sees that again or if it needs to jump in and help, they're trained and ready to go for every one. Can you imagine how many that is? And then again, your body also, as we talked about at the beginning, is also able to recognize every one of your own cells and know that it's not a problem. It is, it is mind-boggling and staggering as you start to break down and think about this. I'm gonna show you a little video at the end that will just be a, a cartoon summary, but, but it, it, it uh, is amazing when you start to consider how all this works together. So all our immune cells come from the precursors in the bone marrow and they will differentiate. That means they grow and become more specific into specialized cells. So we can look at this tree of cells that comes from the initial uh, stem cells in the bone marrow that differentiate or, or specialize and go into uh, another type of cell and each of those then can divide and go into all these other different types of cells. Um, we have these myeloid cells that mature and these give rise to those cells that are your first responders, your TSA innate immune response that engulf and identify and bring things back and, and present those to then teach special ops if they're needed. So that's what's happening in these myeloid cells. And then there's the lymphocytic cells, which gives rise to your more, your special op cells that can be then specifically taught to attack certain antibodies and certain infections. Um, restore life, Anya again will go more into these. When you think of the immune cell though, and just as we're finishing um, with this section, balance is the key to maintaining proper optimal immune function. And uh, if you think about the orbit of the planets and the earth and the solar system, and then they look about, look at how specific that is. And if like the tilt of the earth is off just one degree, or if something is out, that the whole system would not exist. It wouldn't surprise you that the immune system with all that complexity 
is, has that same much precision that if it's altered or changed just a little bit. So the specific things we do to care for our body and to care for those things can make a huge difference. Um, okay, so I want us to think about this and then I'm gonna, if you had any questions about the biology of the immune system, um, we can uh, answer those and then Anya's gonna continue. So if you have, let's just say you have 30 cells, 30 different cell types, and, and each of these cell types have four or five different functions and things that they do. And some of them may have five to 10 different chemicals that they will excrete out at the same time. And if you take this whole array of all of these cells and look at the communication network of how all of them communicate, that the number of lines between all of these different cells would be so tangled. And then if I gave you a list of all the things that they do, and I tried to put it on this screen, it would have to be in like 11 point font and you wouldn't be able to read all the interactions and the complexities that are going on. And it is incredible to see how it all happens and unfolds and all these things will coordinate in such an amazing way. In just this perfect orchestra, everything interacting in its, in, in its response just to fight off an infection. Just when you get stuck with a nail or if your body gets invaded with a bacteria, it is it is mind-boggling. It is like it's when you go out and you look at the stars on a bright, on a dark night and you see how many and it just is, it just is, you know, it's, you're awestruck by all of that and you just think of all of how far out that is and your mind starts to get to the, the idea of infinity that it just goes on and on and on and how could all that be? When you look down small into the body and the way it moves, it works, especially the immune system, it is just like that. They have scientists that have looked at how the body is made and, and uh, have proposed, people have talked about, well, how this came to be over billions of years. And there are scientists now that are now looking at the complexity of the body, the looking at the complexity saying, you know what, a billion years isn't even enough. The mathematics of the evolutionary timeline just don't fit because it is incomprehensible that something like this, for example, that could go, that could go for, so, for so long. Um, so um, that is my summary that doesn't do justice to the video, but uh, that's what will have to what it'll have to be. Any questions about biology of immune system? Anything to add? Okay. All right, now it's time for the second part of this um, lecture here. Unfortunately, we do not have time for a break because we're running a little bit behind. So I'll try to speed through this to cover all this information that we have. But for this part, we are going to be looking at optimizing your natural defenses, specifically how lifestyle can help us optimize our immune function. And we're going to look at some basics on how to do that. We're going to cover a lot of the new start principles with a couple extra letters. Um, just look at some really practical ways that you can practice yourself or share with other people. But I will say that this information is provided for informational use only. It is not for you to use to treat yourself or to treat someone else. If you're going to do any sort of lifestyle change, please take this information, go to your primary care doctor and talk to them about it and make the change with them. All right, I wanna start with this um, quote here on Councils on Health. Um, it says, the only hope for better things is the education of the people in right principles. Let physicians teach the people that restorative power is not in drugs, but in nature. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. And this is just the counsel Ellen White has given us in the importance of living a lifestyle that is healthful according to the principles that God has given us in his word and through inspiration. 
Anyone heard of the blue zones? Anyone not heard of the blue zones? Okay, one person. All right, the blue zones. So this was a study that they did. They were interested. They found five, you can see the five groups of people, five groups of people around the world that were living to 100 and past 100. And they thought, huh, why only these five groups? What is it that makes these groups special? This was actually first published in National Geographic. And they found that there were certain characteristics that all these five groups practiced. And if you'll see, Loma Linda is on the map. And that uh, gave rise to the Adventist health studies that came out later on. But briefly, the different characteristics that they found is that all of these different um, places had movement as part of their natural way of life. They also had a purpose and a reason for living. They also had a certain period in time where they downshifted, meaning they had regular times where they would take time to relax and de-stress. Um, they also tended to not eat until they were 100 plus percent full. They ate till they were about 80 percent full and stopped. A lot of these places also tended to have a plant slant. They tended to eat beans and lentils as a large portion of their diet. They also found that five out of, they interviewed 263 of the people that lived to be 100, and they found that only five of them weren't. Um, involved in some faith-based community. So being involved in a faith-based community was a large part of these communities that lived to 100 or more. They also found that family was a big important part of um, these groups of people, that family came first and, and making sure to spend time with loved ones. Also surrounding themselves with a um, community that supported health behaviors was something they also found, a nice supportive social network to help support um, their lifestyle. And so the restore life, relax, exercise, sleep, temperance, ownership, remedies, emotions, liquid intimacy, or social connection relationships, food and ethics are um, capture little bits of that that they did in that study. So the first thing we'll talk about is relax. And this includes self-care and management. But the first thing I want to ask you guys, do you think stress affects your immune system in a positive or negative way? Negative way. Negative way. You I are. That. Oh, yes. The point where I was able to kill myself in cold just by focusing on positive thoughts for a few hours. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yes, we will see for sure that emotions and stress really does impact our immune system. But... You said you carry your cold? Like yeah, within about two and a half hours. Five. Just thinking positive thoughts, nothing else. Okay. All right. Perfect. So stress, actually, short-term stress can actually be beneficial. It can cause you to be more alert. It can actually help you get more things done. But long-term chronic stress over a long period of time is actually very bad for not only your immune system, but your overall health as well. It actually suppresses your immune system and decreases its um, efficacy. Um, just to quote, the first time, around the first time they started studying stress was in 1986. They studied medical students and they would do a blood sample just before, like one month before they were to take their exams, they took a blood sample. And then the day of the exams, they took another blood sample and they found that their T cells, which we learned about previously, were suppressed as well as other cells in their immune system. And that's crazy. Just the stress of taking a test was enough to dampen their immune system. And since then, there has been more than 30 years of study in this area of research, and it is really confirmed that stress does impact not only your life, but specifically your immune system in a negative way. All right. So benefits, this is what we want to learn about. The benefits of stress management and relaxation reduces stress. It boosts overall well-being. It improves concentration. It improves digestion, aids in good circulation, decreases muscle tension. Um, lowers your blood pressure, reduces stroke risk, promotes emotional health, reduces fatigue, reduces inflammation, and slows the heart rate. Those are the many benefits of practicing things that help you relax and different methods for stress management. And we will go a little bit into those a little bit more practically. So how can we actually do this? How do we make this a thing in our life? So one really good thing is to get out in nature. There's a growing number of studies that support the benefits of being in nature. 
both physical and psychological. Just being out in nature, it's linked to increased self-esteem. It's also associated with the increased likelihood of exercise versus when you exercise indoors. Believe it or not, exercising outdoors makes you more likely to go back and do it again versus if you just exercise inside. It also creates a yeah, natural opportunity for exercise. You walk around, look at the nature, you're gonna be walking, you'll naturally be exercising. And just being in the calming nature, the silence and everything that helps calm us as well. So practical, look for green spaces. Try to spend about 20 to 30 minutes outside each day and that will help. If you can't get outside, like what if I'm stuck in the hospital? What if I can't go outside? Something you can do is look at pictures of nature or play nature sounds or even bring plants inside. We have plants here, very beneficial for our health. All right, and the next thing we touched on a little bit is simply moving. Moving reduces levels of stress, hormones in your body, which is cortisone and adrenaline. It stimulates production of endorphins, which are natural painkillers pain and mood boosters. And again, moving those muscles just kind of helps relax any tense muscles that you might be holding onto. And so a 20 minute stroll can be very beneficial to not only your mind, but also your um, physical body as well. Do you think this um, increases your body's immune system? Yes. So if it, it's a natural, it's a com combatant for stress and stress is harmful for your immune system. So if you help decrease the stress, your immune system will naturally come back up. All right, something else we can do is deep breathing. Do you guys know about deep breathing? What's the difference between deep breathing and, say, shallow breathing? Deep breathing from the stomach, and then shallow breathing is just from the top. Exactly. So a good way to test if you're doing deep breathing is to put your hands on your stomach and breathe in. If you push your hands out, that means you're probably breathing with your diaphragm. And the benefits to that is that you are fully expanding your lungs, and that helps just get all that oxygen in there and promotes optimal gas exchange. It also has a calming effect. It kind of slows the heart. It lowers and stabilizes the blood, pr blood pressure and it boosts immune function, as well as helping to decrease, decrease the effects of stress on the mind and the body. Um, this is specifically related to the immune system, shallow breathing. So chest breathing, breathing from your chest, enables natural killer cells, so part of your cells in your immune system to cluster in the base of your lungs. That's not good, right? Because they're clogging up air, um, spaces that your body needs to exchange oxygen and gas. And deep breathing um, actually clears that cellular congestion. So that's what you're wanting, especially if you're dealing with a respiratory or a viral illness that gets into your lungs. Okay. And then a day of rest. This is kind of something we mentioned about in the blue zones with the specific time of down shifting. There are various denominations, Christian denominations as well as the Jewish community that take a Sabbath, a specific day of rest where they set aside the things of normal life and dedicate a special time to rest and relax. And it's found that this has um, very holistic health benefits, especially when done for intrinsic reasons. So not an external motivation, but because you want to do it, it has very good health benefits. Um, you can see it helps enhance self-awareness. It improves self-care, enriches relationships, um, promotes spiritual development, and has a positive impact on the week to follow, not just on that specific day. Um, and I want to read you this quote from an article written in 2011. It says, the religious practices and traditions that mark Jew the Jewish Sabbath set it apart as a day different from everyday occupations and routines. Sabbath values focus on spirituality, respite, relationships, and community promoting a more balanced lifestyle. Sabbath keeping continues to have relevance in modern times as it is an oasis or counterbalance to the harried pace of modern life with its exposure to incessant stimuli, technological innovations, and our resilience, our reliance on electronic devices. Understanding the form, function, and meaning of Sabbath keeping may help occupational scientists have a better understanding of the place of religion and spirituality in occupational choice, cultural identity, and well-being. 
and Sabbath not only facilitates um, benefits to your immune system, but other area, areas in your health, life as well, such as adequate sleep, reducing stress, more time for social connection, and may provide more opportunity for more exercise as well. All right, exercise. Do you think exercise has immune benefits? Yes, we wouldn't be talking about it if it didn't. <laughs> All right, so exercise does. And exercise meaning consistently doing something active that you enjoy. Let's take a look at the immune benefits of exercise briefly. It's anti-inflammatory. It promotes bone health and strength, which is good because we see that most of your immune cells come from the bone. Promotes good circulation, which helps your immune cells circulate throughout your body to have good surveillance for any type of viral infection that might be trying to arise in your body. It increases immune cell and antibody circulation. Um, we said that uh, has a brief rise in post-exercise temperature, and we'll talk a little about later why this is beneficial when we talk about hydrothermal therapy. Lowers stress, you feel healthier, more energetic, and you feel better about yourself. And that is just a picture about specifically how it relates to um, different inflammatory markers and in immune cells. Yeah. Okay. And then specifically, do you think it matters if you exercise regularly or not? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it does. So individuals who exercise regularly have a lower incidence in intensity of symptoms and mortality related to viral infections specifically. And that's relevant to pandemic times, but also other times as well. There's vir viruses everywhere, every day. Um, it also aids in maintaining a healthy body weight. It decreases inflammation like we saw. And in those ways, it can help prevent chronic non-communicable diseases such as heart disease and diabetes. Now, if you exercise moderately, it does um, temporarily stimulate cellular immunity. So it can be a good, going for a brisk walk, even if you're feeling ill, can help stimulate your immune system to help take care of whatever may be ailing you. All right, and exercising outdoors, we mentioned the benefits of being outside and breathing the fresh air and the benefits of being in nature. So if you exercise outdoors, you will definitely get those as well. It's kind of like a two for one, benefits of exercise and the benefits of nature all for one. Um, and it's beautiful, and we'll talk a little bit about how being and beholding something beautiful is actually beneficial to your health as well. And what's the most beneficial type of exercise? Walking in nature. Walking in nature, but specifically the one I was looking for is the exercise that you will actually do. Yep, it doesn't matter if you, you want to do something. If you don't actually do it, you're not getting the benefit. So the best type of exercise is the one you can actually do. It can be something simple as you know vacuuming or going for a walk. Going for a walk is a really easy way to get some exercise in. But all these are great options, too. You don't have to limit yourself to one thing or another. Go ahead. Yes, I, I, I know I'm, just, I'm just asking this question, and I have the answer, but I just want to. Swimming gives you deep breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Very good. And it actually is um, not very stressful on the joints because it's resistance in the water. So if you do have joint problems, swimming is probably a really good option. Um, but whatever you can do, if you can do it consistently, exercise does promote deep breathing. So it gives you the benefits of deep breathing. Um, if you want to check how you're breathing, just see if you're breathing from your chest or your stomach really quickly. Um, but all of these are, are great great ways and then some there's so many options you don't have to limit yourself to one that someone does find something that you like and do it all right so we're going to talk about sleep and sleep does play a beneficial role in your immune system let's look at the benefits it reduces stress hormones so it helps reduce um, cortisol in your body it's protective against inflammation it increases growth hormones and melatonin and we'll learn about melatonin in a little bit Promotes immune cell movement in the blood tissues and different tissues in the lymph. It enhances cytokine function. Um, those are the little chemicals in your body that incite different immune reactions. Aids in immunological memory, which is important in your adaptive immune response to be able to respond to a virus or any kind of infection that you encounter for the second, third, fourth, or fifth time. It's important to make sure you have a healthy immunological memory. It also promotes overall health and well-being. Yes. 
Yes. Oh, cytokine. cytokine. So, yeah, so cytokines are different chemicals that your immune cells produce that help give instruction to the rest of your immune cells. So it's like a communicatory um, chemical. So having that um, enhanced, just make sure that your cells can communicate properly with each other you. and you have a swift response. Yes, no, great question. All right. What is melatonin? Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> it's actually a hormone that is naturally produced in your body. You can see here on the graph that it is not produced very much during the day and it spikes during the night. And conversely, you can see that cortisol spikes during the day and drops during the night until the morning. So why is this important? Melatonin helps promote good sleep. It's a natural antioxidant, so it has protective effects, uh, effects against cancer cells and different things that might be trying to damage your body. It has antiviral, anti-inflammatory properties as well, and it is associated with the down regulation of an overreactive immune system. So if you do have an immune system that's overreactive, sleep can help kind of regulate and bring um, kind of a balance to that overactive immune system. So if it naturally occurs during sleep, how important do you think sleep is? Very important, very important. Um, and something to note that the aging body, as we old, our ability pr to produce melatonin decreases. So you might need to take a supplement as you get older, but check with your doctor first before you start any supplementation. Yes. You know, I was wondering, maybe you're going to get to this in a second, but I look at this graph, is that saying that melatonin reduces the effects of cortisol? Does it actually destroy the cortisol? Because I've heard cortisol is a unhealthy stress hormone mm, well, all the functions of the body. Well, like we talked about with stress, acute stress is beneficial, but prolonged stress is bad. And like you, like you saw here, it does have a counteractive effect. So if you don't sleep, you aren't really getting that spike in melatonin. So your ability to kind of help combat any cortisol in your body is not there. So getting sleep is important. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so the melatonin doesn't actually, you know, directly cause the cortisol to be up or down. It's just the way the rhythm works. Mm -hmm. It's the cycle. It's just a cycle. Yeah. Thank you. So melatonin and cortisol work in a cycle like that, and they do kind of have a synergistic dance together. But if you don't sleep, you kind of missing out on that part of the, that dance cycle. cycle. Yep, messing up the cycle of the dance between cortisol and melatonin. Very good. All right, and then when do you think the best time to get melatonin is? At nighttime, yes, in the darkness. So good sleep hygiene includes having a dark room. Having a dark room promotes, the, promotes healthy amounts of melatonin. And something to think about is something that I don't do as much, but think of sleep as medicine. <laughs> think of sleep as medicine and protect it and take it as if it was a pill that you have to take every single day, protect it. Keep a consistent sleep and wake cycle that helps with being able to fall asleep easily and feeling more refreshed. Um, something to help with that is to put away your screens one hour before bed. Sometimes a blue light, having light um, in your face when you're trying to go to sleep will mess up your circadian rhythm and your sleep-wake cycle. If you do wake up during the night, which I have done before, try not to look at your clock. Sometimes if you look at your clock, you'll become anxious about all the sleep that you're losing and you won't be able to fall back asleep. So just close your eyes. Um, maybe say a prayer, read something, um, but try not to do too much activity in bed or check your clock. And then develop a sleep routine you enjoy. That's the practical part of getting healthy sleep. Okay, temperance. We will touch a little bit on this. What is temperance? Yep, 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 we will talk about that here, little mumblings, we'll be good. All right, so avoid harmful substances is part of temperance. And this is in another lecture that we don't have time to go into, but I can briefly talk about them. But immune busters um, is nicotine, smoking, anything really, anything smoking is bad for your lungs, marijuana, alcohol, and caffeine. And just briefly, I will share a little bit about that. Nicotine impacts the immune system. Um, 
It potentiates heart disease and lung disease, so it damages your lung and enhances viral infection. Smoking causes lung, lung damage and increases your immune response. It also um, exposes you to harmful toxins as well as pro-inflammatory responses that can dysregulate your immune system. Um, if you're fighting and trying to fight a respiratory viral infection like COVID, um, it would be wise to avoid these things. That they do put your lungs at a disadvantage. Vaping, it's not on here, but vaping is relatively new. Um, there's ongoing studies about what it will actually do to your body. They're expecting it to have similar negative effects as smoking, if not more harmful. Yeah, so we don't, we're, we're expecting it to be worse, negative, if not worse. So I advise avoiding that. Um, and then alcohol, excessive intake is linked to impaired immune function. And it's like, oh, what if I just drink a moderate amount? You know, will that really, really do anything? And they have actually found, yes, um, moderate to drinking does have risks involved, although not as great as, say, if you're doing a lot of drinking. But, you know, if you can avoid risk, avoid risk. And then caffeine, um, the studies are still ongoing, and they are inconclusive at this time. Yes? Um. I have a cousin that just came into the family years ago and my uncle adopted her and <clears throat> I had never been at the visitor but recently her husband died and she invited me to come see her mm. and she was going to be using marijuana so she wanted to do it outside and um, so she had this big container and it was, anyway, mm -hmm. um, what are there any benefits from the non, um, I don't know, whether you say addictive or the, anyway, the TH whatever versus the, the other? CBD? It's, yeah. In other words, if, if you were talking, well, she has pain, whatever. So if, if you were talking to her and she wanted to know, would you say, well, if you want to use any, use that other, the CBD? The CBD versus THC. I mean, like, it's like she feels she needs this other one. But. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I know THC, it does have a negative effect on your immune function. Okay, yeah, yeah. And do you have any CBD? Any comments? Well, I mean, um, CBD contains most of the time THC. And, um, and people use it for various reasons, mostly for pain. Right. You know, um, you know, marijuana. You know, now, now it's, it's the thing to do, and there are studies that show the benefits. But ultimately, it, 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 the, the risk that will really benefit, and so uh, we're not going into the you know a whole yeah. discussion about it. Right. I, I would just recommend avoiding it. Because ultimately it affects the mind, it clouds the mind, yeah. it, it depresses the, the, the yeah. immune system and the mental health. Yeah. And God is not able to communicate with you efficiently and people lose the sense of motivation. Mm -hmm. it, it, it decreases the sense of motivation. And people who smoke marijuana, uh, the studies have shown that you know, like young people can finish high school or college. They're not, I mean the motivation is not there. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's, it's interesting, right. I actually had a patient to me just said, he said, hey, I quit marijuana. He just said, oh, I asked him about smoking. He goes, no, I don't smoke. Well, I, I smoke marijuana. I used to, but I quit. I go, oh, that's interesting. Why? He goes, I just got tired of just not being motivated to do it. <laughs> I, mean, he, he, I, I mean, I didn't have to tell him. He told me why. And, then he, and he feels so much better. And then it's just like, it's a big So I think the idea that it's, that it's just like a neutral thing. Yeah. I mean, it's true, chronic pain, if you had to choose between taking narcotics all the time or THC, that, that's a risk benefit to thing, and I think it's a discussion you can have, but right. by, by, I think both of those things cloud the mind, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. anyways, go ahead. Thank you, everybody. We have doctors in the house, which I'm so thankful for. <laughs> I just wanted to also comment on alcohol, because when you say excessive alcohol, that is a, that is a relative term. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, again, avoidance is better than... That's because, true. Because what is excessive for me may not be excessive. Yep, that's true. I mean, if there's a risk associated with something, 
the wisest thing would to be avoid the risk entirely. Um, but it's up to individuals to weigh the risk versus the benefit. But definitely if something is risky, it's good to avoid it. All right, we will breeze through this really quick. These are just a bunch of different risk, um, risky subjects, substances associated with addiction and all sorts of different health, negative health effects that are associated with it, not related only just to immune system, but other areas in your life as well. And we won't go too much into that, but it's really useful. And you guys got your pictures, so we'll move on. So yes, temperance, we talked about it. So moderation and things that are good and the total abstinence of things that are bad. And this sounds like a great thing, right? Especially related to your health. We only have one body and one life here. All right, ownership, reclaiming your power to choose. Do you think taking ownership of your health is important? Yes, and this isn't specifically related to the immune system, but when I was doing hospital rotations in um, nursing school, I met a lady that was in the hospital, I was taking care of her, and she was really distressed um, about the fact that she had to have her lung, um, part of her lung removed due to lung cancer, and she had been a smoker. And I just thought, man, you know, if, if only she had known, she could have prevented, decreased her risk for getting this cancer. And um, I think that's the amazing thing about lifestyle. 20% um, is genetics and 80% is related to lifestyle. They did a Danish twin study where they compared the outcome of one twin versus the other. And those are the statistics they come up with. 80% is related to lifestyle. But it's really comforting to know that we do have a say in our health. And the negative outcomes that we, we can experience at the end of our life um, can be reduced. The risk can be reduced. Um, living healthily does not reduce all risk. I've had friends that have lived healthily their whole life and they have died from cancer. Um, so it doesn't prevent you from getting sick, it doesn't prevent you from getting ill, but it does put your body in the best possible position to defend itself against um, sin, the results of sin. All right, we're going to talk about natural remedies super quick, um, specifically related to viral and respiratory infections. Hydrothermotherapy was first, um, have you all heard of John Harvey Kellogg? Yes. Okay, <laughs> speaking to the choir. So he started the Battle Creek Sanitarium and he did use hydrothermotherapy in his sanitarium before antibiotics and before they had studies. And specifically we saw the benefits of, the Spanish, uh, of this hydrothermotherapy during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918 through 1919. Um, some of the sanitariums did hot foot baths two times a day, fomentations on the front and back, followed by cold mitten friction, and we'll get into this a little bit more, so don't worry, along with a simple diet and bed rest. And in 1918, in Minnesota, the Adventist Seminary, they had 90 cases of the Spanish flu with no fatalities at all. And other places treating the same types of patients had a 10 to 20% mortality. So we can see based on other viral infections that it does make a difference and would have a benefit for us today, treating any kind of virus, whether it be a COVID or something else. So the science use of heat to prevent viral infections, infections it is um, very much with sauna bathing, it enhances cardiovascular disease and respiratory and immune function, boosts the mood and enhances overall quality of life and reduces the risk of all cause mortality as well as a bunch of other diseases. The hot air um, can help with respiratory infections and reduce viral shedding and improve the course of a cold, as well as aiding in relaxation, which can be associated with stress management. So another good plus for your immune system. Yes. Oh, and heat. We mentioned heat. After exercise, you have a little rise in temperature. So your body is, in a sense, giving you a little mini sauna, and it's just boosting the circulation of your immune cells. Um, either after your exercise or during the sauna, yes. I have this thought, if your body gets warmer when you exercise, is it best to let it cool down before you eat, or like cool down after a sauna before you eat? Because I thought about that this morning. Hmm, that's a good thought. I haven't thought of it before. That's definitely something good to look into. Anyone have? Well, I said that uh, should you let your body cool down after exercise or a sauna before you eat? Well, the way I would answer that question is I, I would recommend exercising after you eat 
because then you know the cells are more sensitive to insulin because that's what you want to try to mm -hmm. because insulin dysregulation is part of the problem why we have all many of the health lifestyle diseases we have now. I so see. exercising about a half an hour, so right after a meal okay. is the best way to act, to, to benefit from, uh, from exercise. Because there are so many other benefits to that. Yeah. As opposed to eating after, I mean before exercise. Uh, as opposed to eating after exercise. Okay. Excellent, that's perfect, yes. Um, all right. So benefits to doing hydrothermal therapy, doing hot and cold, that it boosts immunity, stimulates and increases the effectiveness of your immune cells, promotes circulation, seems to aid in vascular health. That hot and cold creating the vascular spasm can help strengthen those muscles um, in your veins and your arteries. It can improve skin and muscle tone and it also has positive mental health effects. All right, and this was taken from a Hydro for COVID um, website. This guy was named Bruce Thompson and he's a thermotherapy consultant in Australia and he made this website specifically for COVID-19. Um, he initially starts to do a prophylactic regimen. It's a cold shower at the end of your normal shower and you basically stand with the water running over your head and neck as cold as you can stand. Um, and then turn it hot until it's as hot as you can stand without burning yourself. And you do that for um, about three minutes and then turn the hot water off and go back to cold. And then just kind of do that initially um, over several days to kind of get yourself used to it. And then you can start um, the contrast shower. Like we mentioned, start with warm water, increase to the highest tolerable temperature, hold for a minute, lower the temperature, coldest tolerable temperature, super cold, do it for 30 seconds and do that cycle about one to two times, three cycles of hot and cold total. Lower to neutral for about one and a half minutes and then end on cold. That's how you do that. And that's really good for just stimulating your circulation, helping the blood flow throughout your body and moving the immune cells and helping get rid of any congestion that might be in your lungs and things like that. When you're done, dry vigorously with a towel and then get dressed. This is really good to do on a daily basis or especially if you feel like you're getting sick can just kind of help give a boost to your immune system. Um, these are more like treatments. You can do cold compresses, uh, mitten friction to follow up any hot treatment, fomentations to the chest, that can be good for respiratory, um, viral infections where you have congestion. Um, this is what they did at, this, at the um, seminaries. So that's good for treatment. You can do hot foot baths and all those other different things that we don't have time to go into because we're running out of time. <laughs> There's just too much information. But I will tell you, there are contraindications to hydrothermotherapy. Um, some of these are diabetes, heart disease, um, some different types of um, hypertension or varicose veins can be contraindication to hydrothermotherapy. So please check with your doctor before you start. Um, Yes, always check with your doctor before you start something new. I'll repeat that until I'm blue in the face. <laughs> All right, health supplements for healing. Um, you might be familiar with these. We have vitamin D, zinc, quercetin, vitamin C, N-acetylcysteine, selenium, and melatonin, which we already talked about melatonin. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I will just briefly sum summarize that a lot of these help with immune boosting effects and are antioxidants that help combat any damage that your body might be experiencing. So they have immune supportive roles and anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. All right, emotions. Let's talk about emotions. We talked about stress. Stress decreases your immune function. How about negative emotions like depression and anger and anxiety? Do you think those have a negative effect on your immune system? Yep, they do suppress your immune system. They prolong infection. They can also, studies have shown that they also delay wound healing and they can increase pro-inflammatory chemicals in the body, which can cause a um, hyperactive response to different things and lead to things, um, diseases such as diabetes and heart, type two diabetes and heart disease. So if negative emotions have a negative effect, then we know that positive emotions probably have a positive effect. 
So cultivating positive emotions, managing stress, and investigating the root cause of our emotions are good ways to support our immune system. Practicing gratitude significantly increases happiness, improves physical health, improves sleep, boosts your immunity, and it decreases the risk of disease. Some simple ways to help practice gratitude is to keep a gratitude journal. Just spend a couple minutes at the end of the day writing things that you're grateful for. Um, also having positive thought reminders around your home. You could have a Bible text or a picture um, that reminds you of positive things around so that you can see it every day and be reminded of positive things. Also, this is kind of fun. Have a gratitude jar. Have a jar where you can easily access it. Write down something on a piece of paper. If you find something funny or something that you're grateful for throughout the day, drop it in the jar. At the end of the day, bring the jar to the table. If you're eating at dinner and just kind of share, you can pull one out and just review the, the happy things and the things that you're grateful for at the end of the day. And something else is reading the Bible has a big impact on, on the mood, especially that I have found when I read the Bible and um, focus on God, I am, I am more grateful for what he has done for me. So scripture and um, the Bible can be a great comfort and a reminder of um, everything that we have to be grateful um, for him. And the Bible says, we said this already, but a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. All right, we're going to talk about the significance of awe. And this isn't something I hadn't really thought of until preparing for this lecture, but beholding beauty, beholding beautiful things is a mood booster, suppresses um, stress, it's anti-inflammatory, it actually encourages your inclination to help other people. It stimulates wonder and curiosity and promotes greater well-being. And they actually found, um, UCSF did a study, that it facilitates scientific learning and reasoning in children. It's amazing just being out in nature and experiencing the wonder of God's creation, even though it is marred by sin, can still have amazing health benefits for us. And if you can't go out in nature, looking at beautiful pictures of nature or um, inspiring pieces of music that, that give you that sense of wonder and awe, those all produce the same effect. So if you think, oh, I can't, I'm bed bound, I can't get out. We've got beautiful um, YouTube videos with music. You know, there are things you can do to experience awe and get the benefits of awe as well. All right, this is from the Mayo Clinic. Just some quick stress management strategies. If you have a stressor, you can avoid it. You can alter it appropriately. You can accept it or you can adapt. And I find that God in his wisdom gives us um, wisdom on how to do these four different stress management strategies, especially if you have to accept something, something that means to forgive somebody. And God um, can give us a gift of forgiveness and help us so that um, that thing that might be bothering us won't be so much of a stressor in our life. And we mentioned investigating the root. Um, our emotions, this is just a graphic that I found off of Google, so it's not based off of any scientific data or article, but I thought it was very intriguing. It's a cycle of beliefs, emotions, and thoughts, and how they connect and influence each other. Um, and I thought of, I'm not sure where the quote is from, but thoughts produce words, which produce actions, which produce habits, which produce characters. So the chain effect, um, yeah. Yes. Oh, no problem. So was it avoid, alter, adapt, and what was the other one? Accept. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, liquid. And we got 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, liquid. Drinking water. Adequate water intake is very beneficial to your health. Mainly, it helps improve your circulation so your blood cells, um, your immune cells can communicate and move to where they need to be to fire infections, whether it be bacterial or viral. So it's key in maintaining a healthy immune system as well as health. How much of your body is made of water? 97%. Pretty high percentage. 70 to 90% of your body is made up of water, depending on what specific system you're looking at. But generally, we are bags of mostly water. <laughs> so it's very important to hydrate with water, which is what we mostly are. Um, it helps with waste. Um, elimination, transport of oxygen and nutrients and different things throughout our body, which is essential to health. Um, limb circulation, which is a component in your immune system, and it can help reduce muscle tension and headaches and fatigue. 
Um, sometimes I, how much water should we drink a day? Your weight in ounces. Yep. They say half your body weight in ounces is how much you should drink a day. Sometimes, depending on your weight, it might seem like a lot. So a good um, kind of place to start is doing six to eight cups a day. You know, you'll be heading in a positive direction, and it definitely seems very doable. Um, Sometimes I have trouble remembering to drink water. Some ways that you can help is to set reminders. You can set alarms on your phone or carry a water bottle around with you. And they have apps and different fun little things to help you track and remember to drink water. But remembering to drink water is very important. And um, a great way to start off the day is having a cup of water by your bed. Drink it as soon as you get up. You already feel like, yes, you know, I've had a cup of water. I can continue it throughout the day. So you're a great way to start. Um, drinking water and building that habit. Ooh, let's see it in here. Nope, that's later on. Okay, many beneficial effects to water. Um, if you drink two glasses of water before your meal, you will eat about 22% less calories. So if you're looking to um, eat a little bit less, that's a great way. Drinking water is a great way to kind of suppress your appetite. It also stimulates your metabolism as well by about 30%. Why shouldn't we rely on like soda for our liquid intake? Sugar. Yep, there's sugar and it's a very so easy way to get. Sugar, what? Is it like 7% sugar? It's a sugar. lot, a lot of sugar. Yeah, there's a lot of sugar in soda. Mm -hmm. Lots of uh, unneeded, unneeded, unneeded sugars. Drinking water is your best friend. All right, social connections and intimacy, healthy relationships are a positive impact for your immune system. Decreases stress, decreases feelings of social isolation and loneliness, boosts immunity, speeds healing, increases resilience, prolongs longevity. Remember the blue zones that we talked about? And it lowers blood pressure and promotes better health. Um, pr some practical ways to connect with other people is to make it intentional. Write people, call people, video chat people, meet up to go for a walk. Um, I'm finding in life, as we get really busy, sometimes it's easy to let social connections slide. But make it intentional, as it is important to physical and mental health. Um, you can find a group to connect with, um, a faith group, different clubs, get involved, volunteer. Those are all different ways to break the isolation. All right, food. What things should we avoid? avoid animal products. High sugar diet suppresses immune function. High sodium diet increases inflammation and increases um, an excessive immune response. And high fi fat diet slows antibody production, suppresses immune system in that way. So what should we eat? I've heard everything that, that's not on the menu this, this week. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what should we eat? So what can we eat if we're going to avoid high sugar, high fat, high salt? What is left for us to eat, right? That eliminates all those processed foods. We're going to eat whole food plant-based diet, which includes green leafies, veggies, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and healthy fats. And look at that. Eat the rainbow. You have a lot to choose from, and you will be doing a favor to your body. They are fiber rich, nutrient dense, and have a lot of the um, supplements that we talked about that are beneficial to your health. Lots of antioxidants as well. And I wanna say your bones are built from what you put in. So if you put quality in, you will get quality out. Quality out, all right. Okay, immune benefits, um, anti-cancer, antiviral, antimicrobial. Promotes a healthy microbiome. We talked about the importance of that. Eating a whole food plant-based diet does help ensure that that is functioning properly. How about meal timing and intermittent fasting? That, that is a thing that does help promote your immune system as well. Reduces inflammation. It's protective against different lifestyle-related diseases. It enhances insulin sensitivity. Um, all sorts of wonderful things. It actually triggers an adaptive immune response, so it primes you f to counteract stress and antigen encounters. Now, how would you go about doing meal timing and intermittent fasting? There's a lot of different options. They have like a 24-hour fast um, or like a 
5-2 method where you eat 500 calories for two days and then the rest of the, cal rest of the days you eat normal. Um, that gets a little complicated and it can be kind of stressful to think, oh man, I can't eat for a whole day and I'm going to be so hungry. So the one that I have found to be most beneficial is called time-restricted eating. It's basically where you eat for a window of period and you stop eating for a window of period. And the common numbers are um, fast for 16 hours and then eat during an eight hour period and you can choose your window or 14 fast and then eating between a 10 hour window. And these are great because most of the time you're going to be sleeping when you're fasting. So you don't even have to think about, oh, I'm hungry, you're gonna be sleeping. So if you have more questions about that, we can talk later. We just have to go a little bit fast. Um, this is just a pyramid about a little bit how to base your meals. Grains, six to 11 cups a day. Vegetables, three to five. Fruit, two to four. Um, legumes, seeds, and nuts. And if you have meat alternatives, two to three. And then fortified dairy substitutes, I would say switch that to soy. Um, just because in dairy there is a lot of um, cholesterol which can be bad for your heart and vascular system. Again, there's the water, and then added fats and sugars, try to avoid those. There are healthy fats, such as olive oils and things that are um, liquid at room temperature that are healthy and essential, so don't cut those out completely unless it's medically necessary. And this is just an example. This is typically what Americans eat, very kind of brown, and you can see whole food plant-based eating this tends to be more colorful. So as you're looking to make changes in your diet, think color, eat a rainbow of color, and don't worry about trying to overhaul your diet and make it different all at once unless it's medically, medically necessary. But think med, um, little changes like, oh, I can have a more serving of vegetables here, or oh, I can have another healthiness salad. Think about what you can cut out. And supplements for healing, like we talked about, a lot of them are found in the colorful fruits and vegetables found. So if you're eating a wide variety of um, foods, you will be getting all the micro and macronutrients that you need. And the cool thing about whole food plant-based diet is you don't really have to worry about calorie restrictions. Vegetables, fruits, um, nuts are pretty high, but vegetables, fruits, and um, different fibers are low, naturally low in calories. Okay, we are almost done. We are doing good on time. Yay. We'll be a little bit over, but we made it. This is our last um, acronym that we're going to talk about, so thank you for bearing with me. Ethics. Ethics is not super studied super well in relation to health, but it is just beginning to be studied. And ethics is the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. This includes the moral code, moral principles, values, right versus wrong, a code of conduct, beliefs, and also can be included in faith and religion. And this does impact our health. Again, remember this slide, how our emotions and how our stress are affected by what we believe and what we think. Do you guys think there's a connection with our values and our beliefs to our health? Yes. Um, we, I, I said, again, you know, this is just in the beginning of being studied. We'll see that a little bit later. Um, but Ellen White was ahead of her time. This is what she says on Councils on Health, and science is finally catching up to her. So to become acquainted with the wonderful human organism, the bones, the muscles, the stomach, the liver, the bowels, the heart, the pores of the skin, and to understand the dependence of one organ upon another for the healthful action of all is a study in which most, um, this was specifically written to mothers, but I think we can all say it applies to all of us. To mothers slash humans, um, we generally don't take an interest in it. We know nothing of the influence of the body upon the mind and of the mind upon the body, the mind which, which allies finite to the infinite. They do not seem to understand. Every organ of the body was made to be servant to the mind. The mind is capital of the body. Yes. Um, inspiration tells us that there is a connection. Um, various studies do start to show that there is a connection, but it's still science needs to catch up with this statement here when we are a little bit. So moral injury, how many of you have heard of moral injury? You have? I observed it and I've encountered the concept before, but I've never heard it said like this, this is, this is good though. 
Moral injury. So moral injury is relatively a new topic. It's still in its infancy, and there are very few studies on it, and they're, the ones that are there are mostly done in military service members and veterans. And moral injury has been shown to have a significant impact on the mental and physical health. Here we go. This is from the Moral Injury article written by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Moral injury can occur in reaction to a traumatic event in which deeply held morals or values are violated. The resulting distress may lead to PTSD, depression, and other disorders in which feelings such as guilt, shame, betrayal, and anger are predominant, although these feelings may occur in the absence of a formal disorder. Although most research that has been conducted has found, focused on military veterans, moral injury can occur outside of a military context. So even though this is in its infancy as far as the study goes, there is uh, speculations that it can apply to other people in other situations as well. Living in line with your morals, beliefs, and values promotes psychological and therefore immunological and physical health and well-being. Um, violating them as we see can create a lot of distress and cause harm to your mind and your body. And also violating your own versus another person's can have negative effects not only to yourself but to someone else, as well as the quality of life. All right, we're going to go jump back to the blue zones really quick, specifically about rate, um, faith, religion, and spirituality. Um, we mentioned in the beginning that they interviewed 263 centurions, so people that lived 100 plus years, and they found that the majority of them belonged to some faith-based community. So there's their argument about the, um, the positive impact that faith and religion and spirituality has on the mind and the body and in connection with longevity. And research in the same um, article about the Blue Zones, the research indicates that attending faith-based services just four times a month will add four to 14 years of life expectancy. It's pretty good. And then this was just a super complicated diagram that someone made studying the relationship between religion, faith, and spirituality, and our mental and physical health. And basically, they did find everything impacted everything. We won't go into that. And you have made it to the end <laughs> of the Restore Life Lecture. <laughs> so just to recap, take time to relax. Um, exercise 30 to 40 minutes every day. Outside, breathe in that fresh air. Do something you love. Do something that you enjoy. Sleep. Develop a good sleep routine. Aim for seven to nine hours of sleep per night. They found that if you get um, less than six and more than nine, you actually have negative health effects. So it's kind of like a U shape. So that sweet pot of seven to nine. Um, age does determine how much you need. Um, if you're younger, you need more, especially if you're infant or a child, and then it kind of evens out when you become an adult. Temperance, avoid all things that are harmful and risky to yourself, and be moderate in all things that are helpful. Ownership, um, remember that you are in charge of your health, and reclaim and um, value that power of choice that each of us has. Remedies, um, hydrotherapy and supplements, if you need, remember to check with your doctor before starting any of them, but they can be a great benefit to your health. Emotions and attitude, practice gratitude, stress management, find the root cause of your emotions, um, trust in God. And then liquid, remember to drink um, six to eight cups of water today or half your body weight in ounces. Um, and if you drink, yep, it'll be good for your health. Cultivate healthy relationships and social connections. Eat a wide variety of whole foods and plant-based um, foods. Practice intermittent fasting if you can, and move away from packages and things that are in um, process, and make small changes at a time. And remember to be patient with yourself. If we've been living one way for a long time, um, just remember it takes time to form a new habit. And ethics, um, strive to avoid moral injury to others, and consider incorporating faith and spiritual, spiritual things into your life if you haven't already. And further reading and resources, we have the Blue Zones, different things in the Blue Zones, How Not to Die and Survive a Pandemic by Dr. John Campbell, the Hydro for COVID website, as well as um, Life and Health. I don't know if you heard of Life and Health. They're a great resource as well. Um, American College of Lifestyle Medicine has a lot of great resources as well. 
pictures and diagrams and articles that are really good if you're looking to learn more about um, lifestyle medicine and how it can be a positive, not just in the area of immunity, but on all areas of your health as well. And I don't know if you have seen, but the Adventist uh, Medical Evangelist Network, AMEN, did come out with a little brochure specifically for COVID-19, just talking briefly about some of the things that we talked about today. Um, they also have a website for this as well, so you can always go to their website. And that's another great resource if you're wanting to share um, quick information with somebody. All right, to close, I just have a couple of um, quotations. This one's from Councils on Diet and Health. God has beautifully provided for the sustenance and happiness of all his creatures. If his laws were never violated, all, and if all acted in harmony with the divine will, health, peace, and happiness instead of misery and continual evil would be the result. A careful conformity to the laws God has implanted in our being, the natural laws of health, the way our body wants to work, will ensure and there will not oh will ensure health and there will not be a breaking down of the constitution. Amen. Amen. And then from the medical ministry, page two fifty nine, the principles of health reform are found in the Word of God. When were they first given to us? In the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Specifically, diet was given to us in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And the Sabbath, the day of rest, which brings all the social connection with God and other people and stress reducing all comes in that package of the Sabbath. It's beautiful. Um, in the Word of God. The gospel of health is to be firmly linked with the ministry of the Word. It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great efforts to proclaim the gospel message. Amen. And then, let me see. One more. This is Councils of the Church, page 214.2. I was again shown, this is Ellen White, Mrs. White talking. I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. Is this important as we're thinking about the Lord's return? Yep. It is, a closely, it is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. It's pretty connected, right? <laughs> the law of the Ten Commandments has been lightly regarded by man, but the Lord would not come to punish the transgressors of the law without first sending them a message of warning. The third angel proclaim, proclaims that message. Had men ever been obedient to the law of the Ten Commandments, carrying out their lives, the principles of those precepts, the curse of disease now flooding the world would not be. I believe this also pertains to the laws of health. If we follow the laws of health, a lot of the lifestyle-related disease that we experience would be avoided, if, yeah, if not prevented, at least the risk, the risk decreased. And I want to mention that um, it's, I think, just as keeping the Ten Commandments isn't in of our own ability to do, I believe the laws of health are also something that the Lord gives to us. In Philippians 2.13, this is one of my favorite verses. It says, for, God, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And this, I do believe, um, is God's promise to us to enable us to live according to all he has called us to, be it the Ten Commandments or the laws of health. All right. Um, let's pray before we open for questions. <laughs> let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, the beauty of your word and the principles of health um, and the principles for life and happiness and peace in relation to you as well as um, with ourselves and to other people that you have given us in your word. We're thankful for the counsel you have given us um, through the spirit of prophecy um, related to lifestyle and how it is your will for us to be healthy and happy not only in this life but in the life to come. We are so thankful, Lord, that it is you that will empower us to live um, the lives that you call us to, um, whether it be healthfully as well as um, morally and spiritually, Lord. We're thankful that it is you that provides um, the power to do all you have called us to do. Lord, I pray that as we end this session now, that this information would be a blessing, um, not only to the people here, but the people that, um, may it, that it might be shared with. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.